Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Hey there, it's Jeff uh, from GST. Thanks so much for for joining for for another episode. I uh, was talking with Kate Port in this episode, uh, who I've known for a long time. We were both part of the Boston Product Product Management Association, the BPMA, as we call it, uh, and we we've just been friends for a while. Always going back and forth on best practices and. It was really focused on a lot of product knowledge for a long time. And then I recently saw that Kate had taken over uh, customer success and support and everything, which is a topic that I've been trying to find somebody actually to talk about. So I think you guys are going to love this. Uh, Kate's super detail oriented. Uh, She gets a lot of stuff done and uh, is very passionate about her work and, and always wants to do the right thing, but also wants to do the right thing by the customer. So give it a lesson and uh, we're looking forward to hearing any feedback. Thanks. There we go. All right, so Kate, we are recording. Uh, I'm joined by Kate Port, who we, wow. Again, this is second podcast in a row. I'm trying to think how long we've known each other. We've never worked directly, which you should be proud of that. Um, <laughs> but um, I'd say it's probably been at least 10 years. Um, I think I think about 10 years. Yeah. yeah. And so the quick background on that is that um, I was doing my on again, off again stint as a product person. And uh, I joined the Boston Product Mentorship. No, Boston Product. Oh, my God. I'm the worst. Just shoot me BPMA. Right now. The, the yeah, mentorship. I just see BPMA, right? That's <laughs> all I see. Boston Product Management Association, which is great. And I'm still a mentor, but I do feel, though, at this point in time, um, you know, in Dancing with the Stars, when they don't get the, the dancer that they want to dance with, like, that's how I feel, like, when they get paired up with me in the mentorship process. So. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an art, certainly, yeah. to, to get them. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> so, so, um, so the funny. Oh, see, is another thing. You're gonna laugh. I'm gonna. I just had to edit one of my latest podcasts, and it's a drinking game for when I say it's funny, because that's my like new transitional thing. So I'm I'm gonna mark one right now. So I gotta. So you got a one that. in the tally. Yeah, I got a one in the tally here. So I, you just will die laughing every time I say it's funny. But, however, semicolon, uh, one of the reasons why I reached out to you, um, you know, we certainly go back and forth on LinkedIn and things like that. Mm-hmm. Is I, so I store all my, like, podcasts, blog ideas, you know, things I need to do in my business on, on a Trello board. And I have had this thing sitting in my backlog, um, pardon the French, but it says how not to fuck up your product in your implementations, right? And, and mm-hmm. so... Um, So what does that mean for me? Well, usually when I'm helping startups or part of a startup, the implementations can be a pretty brutal process because there's just, it's like the last thing thought of like, okay, let's get a lot of features out there. Let's, you know, you're trying to win the feature game and I totally get it. But then there's this point where implementation should be pretty smooth and they should be pretty fast. So you can get that fast time to value. We're talking SaaS, B2B stuff here. Um, but it's not. And there's all this stuff missing, which I wanted to kind of go through. But I actually don't have that exact <laughs> background or, or I should say I'm not running product management. So I wanted to talk to somebody who's in product management. But then when I saw that you had taken over, um, not taken over like in a coup, which is an interesting word these days, but uh, but you were started focusing as well on customer success. I'm like, that's it. That is the perfect combo right there. So Kate, yeah. that's, that's how we're going to sort of talk 
you know, for the next half hour or so. But I would love for you to give sort of a quick minute, like how did you get to where you are and then what are you currently doing right now at uh, ZMEX? Yeah, uh, so my product management career started out, I think um, maybe there's a more formal way that people are getting into product now, but back when, when I got in, uh, I was sort of handpicked, right? Yeah, uh, hey, yeah. I think this role would be good for you. Yeah. Um, I started out at Experian, moved over to Reed Elsevier, um, yeah. did a little bit of a stint over at Name Media, which got bought by GoDaddy, uh, yeah. and really realized that there was a sweet spot there um, for you know, working in a smaller company, having a greater impact. Yep. Um, I was, you know, newer to my career, fairly young, had a lot of energy. So it, it worked for me. And so I've spent some time at Blueport Commerce. And then I've done uh, the last almost five years at ZMAGS. Yep. And ZMAGS has been a really interesting ride uh, because I'm sitting, uh, you know, more on the leadership side of the business, which is great for me. Um, I'm not sure how the company feels about it, right? Uh, but we've we've seen a lot of transition, and we that's total we imposter syndrome, Kate. That's I'm sure yeah. they're loving you. Are you? <laughs> so. A little bit of that every day, right? Um, yep. in, in any role, really. Um, and so I've held, you know, BPMA has certainly helped shape me as well. I was able to participate in that program and sort of see the mentorship uh, oversee that. Um, I was a co-founder of the Boston Women in Products Group with Sarah Patalis yep. and Vanessa Ferranto. So um, really strong leadership there. And, and so at ZMAX, it's been really interesting because we're small uh, and we've got to get a lot of work done. And so yep. there's all these orphan departments. Uh, that kind of crop up in a variety of ways, which I'm sure we'll get to. Yep. Um, right now, my role encompasses product management, user experience. We think about customer success, global services, design services. So there's all these, um, I wouldn't say orphan or redheaded stepchild departments, <laughs> but it's like you talk to a lot of companies and they don't know how to align all of those groups together, right? right. Because we're all really trying to do the same thing. But there's not one strategic individual that's really leading the charge there. Yep. And so um, I stepped in and, and sort of helped out um, a couple of years ago. And so we've been doing a variety of things. We've had a variety of folks helping out. I continue to get validation along the way that that's a really nice way to structure it. But yeah, it's been I a agree. wild ride. Um, product is always going to be bread and butter for me, my passion, uh, user experience, all that. Um, and it's really nice to start to get a different side of the business, um, thinking more about the sales process, implementation, getting customers onboarded, uh, yeah. and, and more the retention aspect of the business. I think the setup is great. Um, you, you know, it, it's funny when you started, ah, there's the, it's funny again. When you started talking <laughs> about uh, BPMA, I yeah. did feel, so, so I'm, a, I'm like, as soon as the company gets to be able to like 200 people, I start getting a little happy feet and everything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is that, and I felt this with BPMA, like very thick structured processes that I feel were, is definitely needed for larger companies. Like I felt like, and a lot, a lot of what I was experiencing and when I went to a lot of the meetings was it was a, it was a, it was a big thing to run product. Like there's yeah. lots of these processes. However, when companies are in their startup and, you know, they're, let's say, Series A, Series B, or, you know, they're in that 20 million, you know, zero to 20 million range. They can't really afford to have all of that. Um, and you do have to structure it in a proper way. And, and where I see what you're doing now is extremely enlightening or, or you know, I'm just like, oh, thank God. Because you're talking with customers every day on the implementation customer success side, and then you roll these back to product, and they're like, oh, that's nice. We're going to put it on the back lot, right? And it's like, oh, but they're just like, these are our customers. And so, you know, bringing that customer-centric focus to product, I think, is, is huge. You know, everybody says that they do, but I think if you're out there every day and probably, you know, talking with people and getting feedback, and I think you just did a pre-sales call, so you're hearing it on the pre-sales aspect, that's amazing. And I'm sure, do you feel like it's helping shape your roadmap and the items that your team's working on every day? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I said probably seven years ago at this point is that my goal was to be on, no, no matter what level of an organization I was at, um, to be on the phone with a customer a day. Now, we all know that that ebbs and flows, different parts of the year, different things going on. But it can be very easy to fall out of the, this is who you're building this for. 
right. right? This is the pain. If, if a member of our support team comes to me and says, hey, I'm experiencing this, I don't feel the pain as acutely as if I'm on the phone hearing it from the customer, right? And yeah. I don't want to be pulled into just because of my title, a C-level or, yeah. or, or senior level conversation. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that you're on the ground and really understanding that so that you can pass that feedback along to the team today. No, this is why this is a problem, right? right? Whether it's me or someone on my team that's able to funnel that, I think hearing that and being on the front line really makes it um, impactful, right? It's the difference between saying, oh, I broke my leg and actually like seeing it happen uh, yeah. live in person, right? Yeah. Oh, how awful for you, right? Versus right. like, yeah. oh my how God, that's terrible, right? <laughs> Especially in the pre-sales process, like, as I say all the time, if you're not if you're not at the number one company in in the you know in the in the you know the diagram of whoever the number one companies are, somebody's taking a chance on you, right? So somebody is like literally making maybe a, a career limiting move if they're like, you know what, I'm gonna go with these guys instead, and then suddenly they're like, this is terrible, like they, yeah. I, the, the tears, like I'm gonna get fired, like you hear all of that on those calls, yeah. and just from my perspective product doesn't always hear those conversations. They hear us talk about it and you're raising it up and, you know, the fun survivor travel council called exec staff and everything. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I digress. So that's awesome. What, what does your team currently look like with this structure in place? How is it like team size, you know, whether it's 25 or 30, I'm not really good, but sort of how are they grouped and what type of functional areas? Yeah, so we have, um, so we made the transition from account management to customer success within the last, I would say, three years. Okay. Um, and I won't say that it was a smooth transition. I think it's a really big shift, especially when you're trying to figure out, well, how, what is, what is account management? What is customer success? And then what is support and global services? And we were starting to call it enablement and who was doing oh, yeah. onboarding. And so there was, there was a lot to figure out there and, and, and to, to go through. But right now we've got product management user experience, right? Yep. Which is pretty standard. Um, and then we have customer success and global services. And yep. we're adding in a new arm called design services to the team nice. as well. Yep. Um, so there's sort of like four tops yep. and then design services kind of reports into global services at this point. I wouldn't say that that's the ideal scenario. I think eventually we'll, we'll put design services on its own kind of trajectory. Yep. Um, but you look at all of that being aligned and there's very strong alignment between customer success um, and sales. Right. So uh, we don't have a lot of those, oh, throw these deals over the fence and you sort of deal with it. Um, I mean, we're, we're, you know, just around 50 people, maybe a little bit more than that um, yeah. as late as of late, but uh, we have that ability where there's only 50 of us, right? Yeah. Uh, there's not 250 or 2000 or anything like that. So there is a lot of alignment there. I think a big piece of why that structure has been successful has been communication. Um, you know, we can talk about frustration. There's certainly plenty of it, but, yeah. um, you know, I think we've done a really nice job of trying to align the right people, get the right people in the room so that we're not missing things. Yeah. I, I love it. It's, 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 I, I, you know, just from going through it a bunch of times, that's what works. Right. And I really like how you said, Hey, that's here now. It's probably not going to be here in the future, but that's what we're doing to get through this structure and everything. The thing I always say when people are like, Oh, the account management success, I always just come back to like who gets the commission on the on the renewal and that's your yeah. answer right there so yeah yeah and some people are like oh no like we're success and we don't want to be involved with that and uh and i'm like okay but it's a cost center then and um so make sure you're doing all the stuff you need to be in the yeah. renewal. So, so our customer success team is responsible for the renewal so yeah. that's where the differentiator is between them and sort of onboarding our global services. Right, actually, let's talk about that. Uh, I'm always looking to see what other people are doing. Uh, so we're going in there, we're doing the pre-sales deal, you're going in there, you're talking about it, hopefully doing a little scoping to make sure that they're gonna fit right into your standard thing. Mm -hmm. What's your standard sort of onboarding slash implementation, because they're a little interchangeable these days, sort of, do you say, hey, it's a 30 day thing, it's a 90 day thing, like, what's what's your process look like? And then who's the team that executes on that? Yeah, so um, with our product, in many cases, if we've, so recently, um, 
prior to COVID, we ran, we started running a trial process where we okay. actually had customers in the platform developing content, testing it out. Yeah. Uh, we find that we have, we have a very high close rate. Say, um, yeah. We're looking, you know, somewhere between six to one from cold call, nice. uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so what we're finding is that uh, in order to make the enablement piece easier on the onboarding team, doing a little bit more work up front not only closes more deals because people are like, oh, this is true. Like it really only takes this much to implement, yep. um, but it also has them engaged at the right time. You know, I can come up with a, and this is where we started. We said, well, yeah, we want to have them publishing content within 90 days. That was yep. like four years ago. Yep. Um, 90 days is really not enough time to value if you're thinking about a year long contract. So we said, we're going to aim for 30 days. Um, but that was our internal process for 30 days. That was all of the calls and, you know, you're going through analytics and you're going through this and you're, you know, have we checked all of our boxes? But the right. reality is that the customer views their success metric as very different as the one that we had. And so we had to come up with some sort of alignment there. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is within seven days of kickoff, be able to prove that, yes, you can you can publish content. We have no issues. There's no technical limitations. Very rarely do we come across those. And theoretically, you'd be up and running. Nice. In many cases, there is a less than 24-hour turnaround for that process. That's awesome. Now, it's fantastic, right? We're really, really lucky. But there's a, on the product side of things, for longevity and all that, right? You start to think about, well, how can we be more sticky? How can we make it so that it's more difficult to rip us out, yep. et cetera? So there's a delicate balance that we're playing there, certainly on the more strategic side. But we do want customers to see that value as quickly as possible, if not during the sales process. This is um, amazing. And I'm so glad because this is, I was hoping this is where this conversation was going to be because. <laughs> From you, know, you and we can talk about it, like the work that you had to do as a product team to be able to enable that. Because I'm used to the admin not being a user, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when the product's getting designed, so everything turns into like config scripts, talking mm -hmm. to devs, mm -hmm. overseas conversations, back and forth, talking alongside mm -hmm. each other. Can, do you mind talking, or if I'm totally, you know, if there's nothing there, then say we didn't really do much, but like, how did this influence the product decisions? Because sometimes it might be not building some great sexy feature, but mm -hmm. you get your customers launched a little faster and using it within seven days. Yeah. So I think, um, so we had uh, the product itself uh, launched about uh five years ago, right before I, I joined, maybe about two, two months or so, okay. officially came out of beta while I was uh, at the organization. And one of the principles that it was built on was we want this to remain to be an agnostic tool. We want to work with every e-commerce platform. We want to enable our customers in the most ways. Um, we're not going to get ourselves stuck to one particular platform, right? We're sitting in e-commerce, we're working with marketers. We know that on a regular basis, you're either coming out of every platform thinking about a replatform or going into one, right? right? If you talk to any retailer, that's where they're at, right? Oh, I'm aware, so, yeah. <laughs> that was like 10 years of my life that everybody was replatforming, exactly. So we want to accommodate and work with that, right? At any phase in that life cycle, we can help you out. And so when we came in, one of the big things that we started to realize was that performance was a challenge. And as we thought about um, the ways that we would solve that problem. One of the things that I held strong on from a product perspective was we have got to remain agnostic and it's got to be easy to do, right? We can't all of a sudden come up with some overcomplicated process where the marketer has to then get the IT team involved and yeah. all of this rigor and all, right? Anytime that we have to do a tech call um, on the pre-sale side, it's actually a blessing in disguise because it's booked for an hour or sometimes 45 minutes and we spend maybe 10 minutes yeah. uh, you know the, the the it team is saying oh that's all that it is okay we're yeah. good to go. drop in this one little you know domain name right here and you're good to and go we're good yeah right so um when we thought about some of the new features we came out of beta with something that we developed um in uh late 2018 early 2019 and if i'm being honest my personal view of the user experience was like, this is not my finest hour, right? Yeah. However, when we tested it with customers, they were like, this is great. This yeah. is all we need. We don't need to go crazy. So you talk about that MVP approach, right? We really enable that, you know, I, bread and butter product, right? We said that before. Um, I didn't love the user experience, but I said, I'm not using it every day. Yeah. I'm not working with these people. Let's, let's go show it, right? It's so funny. Oh my God. Drinking So game. many things. Yeah, it's, it's I know. Okay. <laughs> I actually do find it funny though, but you, yeah. you, 
Isn't it interesting, Kate, that yeah. when you work with some UX teams, if they're super creative, I've just seen this a thousand times, they bring in this user experience that looks beautiful and people are like, I can't do my job. So when I was at a company a couple of years ago, I would say like, look, we're designing interfaces for you to use every day. Like mm -hmm. behind the firewall, who cares, right? Like, yeah. is it clear? I'm a non-tech user and like it gets into the product stuff, like knowing who your user is, right? Like, yeah. you know, we're not getting awards for designing the most beautiful red button, right? We want to <laughs> get people through. And that's the thing, right? Is that, so, you know, we had very strong uh, opinions on the UX side of things and the design side of things. And, and trust me, I'm right there, right? That's my, my passion. I want to make things that are, that are beautiful and, and really nice to use, but the focus is what's the most valuable for the customer and how can I get that to them as quickly as possible, right? right? So, so when we developed that, so we kept with that and, and stuck with it. And while it was a struggle to sort of think about how we could do it, it really changed the game for us in terms of thinking about what really makes it easy. Now, I'll say that there are some uh, we have very, you know, occasionally we'll run into a customer where we've got to do something custom or they Everybody want to add does. something oh, that, in, right? The there's customs always, on the list. Let's get to that. That's in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's always going to be something, but I think we really think about how we can get time to value as quickly as possible, allow for a deeper integration at some point when we're ready, when they're really bought in, right? And we're not throwing everything at you at the same time. So you have to keep in mind the ZMAX timeline right yeah. and the customer timeline which are two very oh, different things it's so fun uh, it's but you're like this is <laughs> this is 30 days i know i'm just gonna i'm gonna run and put yeah. a running counter on the web page yeah. uh, you've got it, oh yeah sure this should be 14 days but the customer is like oh i don't have an hour now i don't have this i don't have that i have had to consult with people and say when resources start getting stretched and everything, it's like, listen, we can only give you Johnny for 30 days and then they walk away. And then that kind of helps them focus in a little bit more. It's like, look, we're trying to run a business. We'll help you like, you know, just get that kickoff going and just giving them tasks, which is, you know, we don't have to get into that stuff today, but you're right. Mm -hmm. There's your timeline. And then mm -hmm. there's the customer's timeline. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I'm just trying to make sure that the customer's timeline doesn't extend it out like an additional 90 days. Cause then, your TTV is your like contracts up for renewal and they haven't really used it so much and everything. Yeah. One of the other things that we've added in, and I think it's worth talking about because we're, again, I think you have to think about the size, right? We're, we're just over 10 million. Um, we're thinking about, uh, you know, getting into a real shift here. Next yep. milestone would be 25 million. Yep. Um, we're getting into that critical point where we have to start thinking about some different things. And so recently um, we've gotten a lot of really, really strong uh, advice and advisement. Um, and one of the things that they said was, if you're having, because there are some customers who sit outside of that implementation, right? We're coming up on renewal for a customer who hasn't used us in over yep. a year. Um, <clears throat> and we say, well, how can we get those folks to really be bought into a timeline for time to value? And we started getting recommendations to say, add an implementation fee. Now, I know some people who are listening to this or, or, or hearing about this are going to say, well, I don't know. We might not be ready. You might not be at the size you are. We only probably got to that point recently where we could start saying, look, we're holding you accountable, yeah. right? You have, you have this fee that's associated with this, right? We're, this is your target and setting that up in the sales process. Again, we're doing trials now. So they're typically onboarded before mm -hmm. we even get to a closed deal. So are the there's features, a lot of things. Are, are the features limited during that trial? Um, no, so theoretically, yes. Um, they can't publish anything live oh, sure. or they can't test anything or some customers can, some can't. Yep. Um, we've gotten certain things that can be on or off. Um, yep. So we limit as much as we can, but I would yep. say that we have, that's part of our roadmap is to make things a little bit more plug and play with sure. adding those features in. So on the fee and, you know, I, I always hate saying this, how it sounds. I, I wrote, I'm super passionate about this. I wrote a big article and got lots of feedback on it and mm -hmm. it does make them value you more. And, yeah. and, and being, being able to come in and say like, look, we're going to charge you like 10 K, whatever, some fee, and this is what you get. And you enumerate everything that you're going to do for them. Mm -hmm. And in the pre-sales process, if you expose that to them, they're like, oh, this looks real now. I'm going to yeah. pay this money and I'm going to get this value back. Mm -hmm. And, and also it expires in 30 days because we're in demand and we're the best at the, you know, you know value selling all, all those that things, fun right. stuff. And, and people are like, oh, I'm going to take it seriously versus the like, 
oh, I'm going to blow this meeting off. It's just with those ZMAX guys and whatever. I can just keep that going on forever. It turns into that, you know, term project that you do the last week or whatever. It's, right, it's right. like, I only have 30 days and we, we spent money on this and I'm going to get screwed if we lose the ability to, yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know. So I think we're both aligned there, right? And, yeah. But I think it's just figuring out what the right value is there for, for your contract size and all that. Yeah. But I will say that it was an area that product had on, right? Um, which is interesting because this is where I battle. My product hat says, give it all away for free because it's all valuable. Whereas my, my business hat says, you know, let's really think about what gets them engaged, how they really retain, right? So, so it's really helpful to think about product and customer experience coming together because mm -hmm. in many cases, there's been, I wouldn't say a wall, but like maybe a short wall that you've got to yeah, climb yeah. over to get there, right? Yeah. And, and the sales team is usually like, no, don't charge them. It's going to mess the deal up and everything. And I'm like, well, listen, exactly. like, let's say if, you know, you close 20 deals a year, and let's say it's 5k, like five times, that's, that's good revenue. And you tell, yeah. and suddenly you tell your finance person, like you can recognize this revenue the day it starts and everything. Mm -hmm. There's just lots of good reasons for that. It pays for your staff mm -hmm. to be able to grow them as well too. Uh, in, you know, especially if you start getting bigger and working with more enterprises and suddenly you need like project management into the, yeah. you know, it, it starts getting yeah, into those things. So awesome. Yes, yeah. so we are 100% aligned. So we don't need to hammer that nail anymore, I think. So, so curious uh tool sets like what are you using as sort of the general i like i was just on a call with somebody and they're like oh we're, we're, it's COVID. we're using miro for everything and so everybody's like oh implementation we're using either smart sheets or i use baton on some certain things i'm curious your 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 list of tasks that need to get done that you're working back and forth with a customer how are how are you and you don't have to name the tool but, but yeah. sort of like how are you engaging with the customer giving them homework to do checking in on them every week making sure stuff's done yeah um i would say that um this is where my natural style and my work style compete a little bit <laughs> um i am by nature type a person everything is organized i'm, I'm, I'm shocked out of place. I'm, i, I yeah. could not believe it <laughs> <laughs> yeah for those of anyone that knows me knows that of course at times right but then there's this product piece that says look you you can't you got to focus on you know other things but yeah. um i think that this, again the size company we're at we're at that critical point where we can finally start thinking about process which is exciting for me because what i see out there is just use what you can use what you yeah. need to we've we've yeah. tried things like Basecamp and spark suits and and we've got all kinds of options there um i will probably throughout my career continue to beat the drum that says i am tool agnostic if there is something that's working for you, right? We're at the point at DMAGS where we're not hiring a ton of entry level, right? Mm -hmm. um, people are experienced. We're looking, we're actively looking for folks who have good process that can help us get from that 10 to 25, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, when we think about the tools that we're using, it's really just what can you do to get the job done? We've got the same challenges, yeah, right? Yeah. We're a Microsoft shop and I, yeah. I want to use Google Docs and Google Drive. And so I'm sure that if you talk to my team, actually, I know for a fact that there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, but the big thing is, and we use our, our CRM to do a yeah. lot of like task management. Yeah. Um, and that seems to work really well with the team. Okay. I don't think I know that that will not scale long term. And again, we're right at that inflection point where early next year, in fact, we've got to start thinking about putting some more formal process in place, yeah. um, which I'm excited by, right? Yeah. But it takes away from that product side of, of yeah, the I'll, say, I'll tell you, what, I'll take it to do here. I, I have a playbook that I usually like then fill. I'll send that over to you. Great. It's tool agnostic as well. My whole thing on this is, you know, Sometimes you get called in and it's literally like 10 items on a spreadsheet. Just let's go yeah. over this every week. Just check those off and it's good. And then sometimes it ramps all the way up into, I, I don't get more complicated than like a, a smart sheet or base can't be. I, I, yeah. My thing on that is that it's got to be a tool that the customers really can understand how to use. So smart right. sheet kind of scares the shit out. Excuse me. I'm swearing up the storm. But um, my kids are right around the corner, but <laughs> like, like it, it does scare people. So I try and find something where you can, you can assign people tasks and they right. go in and they understand it. And I'm going to attach the doc here because the Google drive, the one drive, the live, all that Whoa, stuff, whatever, which is right. like, it just gets, into that area we're like oh we're going to connect you to box now and everybody's like another tool like uh, yeah so yeah and that's that stage where it's just like how do we get this so it's easy 
you can talk through it in the pre-sales and the people that, you know, that last meeting where they're like, we're going to bring our team in to make sure that they can handle this. And then you're like, right. yeah, you just go in here and you do this. And they're like, oh, that's cool. I get it. Versus like, here's a Gantt chart. And people are like, oh, oh some no. people love that. You know, so you just right. kind of have to have that in your backseat of like, oh, well, we could do that too. Because because some people like that. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think our goal is to make the Gantt chart look as least, if we were to have one, um, as least complicated as possible, right? We want to have a a limited number of things to do in implementation. Sure, there are avenues that we can go down and paths that we can take, but ultimately, hey, get these five things done and then we're good to go, yeah, right? Yeah, we want to like make that. it really, really simple. Yeah, you're right, because you, you, if your value is that you can get up and alive and running in like seven days, you don't want to be like, oh, here's a project plan with a lot of dependencies. And if yeah. everyone was like, yeah, but I can just go use X, Y, and Z and put my credit card in, you're like, yeah. So you definitely, it's, it's aligned to match, but you might wind up having some more complicated things. You're like, okay, for these types of projects, yeah. we're going to roll this out and stuff like that. So absolutely. Awesome. All right. Let me go over some of the other things uh, that yeah. you said we're going to chat, chat about. So we talk, <laughs> Oh, so here I see this huge thing. This, this confounds me to this day. I, I think it's organization specific, but I will say since SAS started, Mm -hmm. Hard to say that. Ooh, say that um, three times fast. Alliteration right now. I've got my coffee cup in my hand. Uh, I I have not been able to figure this out where I find it's 100% awesome. And this is such a problem. Custom work on the SaaS product. Yeah. So who owns it? So here's the deal for anybody who's like, huh, what, what is this thing that you're talking about? So, you know, early days, CEO sales team goes in and they're like, love your product. But if you guys had X, Y, and Z, that's the deal breaker. And we need that. And you're like, go oh. CEO's like, absolutely. We'll do that. And then, yeah. and sorry, I love CEOs. Some of my best friends, but uh, <laughs> you know, they're so passionate and they believe in their team so much like, oh, we'll just get that done by the time you guys need to go live. Right. I'm shocked. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you're shocked by hearing any of this, but yeah, so yeah. So oftentimes, so hopefully, if you're listening to this, your implementation team has heard about this, but implementation teams are going off, let's talk about what we we're talking about. Here's the base set of tasks that you need to get done. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they get dropped onto this thing where they're like, you need to manage the product team to make sure that these features get built to merge with your implementation timelines. Mm -hmm. This is a rat's nest that could go on for hours if we talked about it, but where are you in this right now? Because you're right in the middle of all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I take a very hard line at this. Um, again, I think part of what's valuable here is that I do sit on our leadership team and I do have a very strong, uh, really philosophy about it. Um, one of my favorite agile principles is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Mm. And I will fight tooth and nail to preserve that because I am building a SaaS product. We are building a SaaS product and I don't want to have all of these different versions floating around. Um, it's not to say that we don't have things that we're testing, but by and large, all of our customers are on the same product. They have two options to do publishing. There are certainly customizations that we have to go through, but for the most part, everybody's on the same platform. There's not different versions and you know, you've got this configuration and I have to remember this when I release. It's just not a scalable way to do things. Um, I will say that I went on maternity leave for eight weeks, which is not a long time. And when I Congrats, came back, Lord. thank you, it was two years ago, yeah. but I remember specifically, I came back and uh, my team, we were talking, our leadership group, they said, oh, while you were out, we agreed to do this thing by the end of the year. Now it was a platform specific feature, right? It was still something that was kind of on everybody our could we use. agreed, yeah. everybody yeah. could use it, right? But we did agree to a date. So even in that case, right, I'm not gonna just sort of agree to a date to win a deal. I know we've gotta do it sometimes, um, but I try very, very hard for that to be the the, the one or two percent as opposed to the majority. Um, you know, all of the things that we're really, really lucky. Our customers are very open with us. I think retailers are, are loud and vocal, but they are also, um, they want to know what other retailers are doing, right? Oh, they're they're yeah, a, a group. Absolutely. So, you know, and it's not to say we only work with retailers, but I will say that, you know, hard and fast, I do try to do that customer collaboration over contract negotiation, really building a SaaS product. Um, I think that that keeps us on the straight and narrow. 
Um, it will become harder in the years to come as we get, you know, larger, but um, and the customization work scares the crap out of me. Uh, and I can't, so many product people that I talk to talk about how they're, you know, oh, we're forced to do this. We've got to have better uh, sort of safeguards in place. And it's not because I want to say no, because I want to be rigid. It's because it's just not a scalable way to build things. Yeah, I, um, it's just the whole like, oh, this customer has these 10 secret flags enabled and they, it's, I, I'm going to, I'll admit, I, I couldn't do it at this one point. Yeah. Like it just did not work out. No. Not the right guy for the job because basically, oh no, implementation owns this. You need to project manage these features going through. I'm like, we yeah. don't manage the dev team and the product, you know, and the gathering the requirements and all of that stuff. It's, yeah. It's a nightmare. It's you know, no I think I'd rather have, let's, let's talk to 10 customers, get 80% of the functionality um, and have, you know, those tweaks either be gaps or, or things that we do later on. But um, we're building, you know, we, we try to build a platform. And um, yeah. for the most part, it's done us well. I will say this problem, like, I, I see this more often than not. I'll, I'll just say that, like, I, I could Same. throw out lots. It's, it's yeah. everywhere. And I yeah. think it's in that. So I, I do, there's the, there's the rush for product market fit. And you're just trying to fill in what your competitors have probably yeah. on your roadmap and things like mm -hmm. that but then there's this like we've got this red button over here and if you want our 100k per year then you need to build that red button and i'm always well like on the collaboration like well what does that red button do and it's like well it enables to do x y and z and <laughs> so yeah so what happens hey, I, what happens if this go oh sorry i cut you off go ahead no go ahead uh, <laughs> what happens if you discover this during implementation right like mm. does, yeah it's like, hey, we're, we didn't realize this. Uh, I know we tried it out for seven days and then we said we're going to go for it, but we really need X, Y, and Z. <laughs> I know this is, yeah. this is the art right here. Yeah, so um, there, are, there is a, a wave coming of, you know, what the next bad thing is related to, you know, <laughs> flash or performance or whatever it is, yeah. right? So one of those things is JavaScript, right? Everybody's yep. like, oh, I'm so, right, performance, everyone's thinking about yeah. this, we think about it, it's sort of constant. I would say that that's something that's starting to pop a little bit, um, but our talk track around those types, of, so that's something that, you know, you go seven days in, you don't realize or whatever, right? And all of yep. a sudden you realize a couple days in or a month in or whenever, that you're, you're challenged here. And um, it's not a surprising conversation. We've got a good talk track around it. We have a plan on our roadmap to address it. Um, I think that what's really important here is being transparent and having those conversations early and often. I won't say that it works every time for every feature, right? There's always gonna be someone who said, well, I thought it worked this way. And uh, sometimes we get into internal conversations where we're like, but they had a week or three weeks to try yeah. the tool. Like they didn't realize that it can or cannot do X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, there, there, there are certainly times where you hate to disappoint the customer. Yeah. And we, we deal with those, you know, again, they're infrequent, but we handle them a, as we need to. I think, um, you know, again, you can't just change your roadmap for yeah. one customer, even if they're, you know, we're, we're really, we're really lucky at DMAGS where we don't have one customer that's like 50% of our revenue or that if we lost that business, we would be under, yeah. I know that there are companies out there that are operating. That's, that that's way, what happens. So they go hit the, they go hit the home run, which means agreeing to all this custom stuff. Right. And then you hear the classic, like they own our roadmap now, which, you know, again, if it's, if it's going towards where you need to be to compete in your industry, I get it. But it's when you're suddenly like, you know, basically a white label platform for, yeah, yeah, that's, that's tough. But I think a lot of times when you, when you land those big deals, one of the things that product people and, and development people don't really think about getting creative is, okay, if that deal is so significant, then hire for resources right? Get them in here, build the thing, get them right. to learn on platform and have it be done. And then once that revenue comes back next year, beauty of SaaS, I've got it next year. I have the feature. Hopefully other customers are getting value. Yeah. So I think you've got to be a little creative on, okay, this deal is, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a hundred grand deal. Yeah. Let's divert because our average order value is 50. Let's divert yeah. 50 of those resources toward or toward resources. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So I think you've got to get creative sometimes. Absolutely. And you're, you're, I, I feel you're going about it in the same, in the correct way, which is like, Hey, sometimes these things pop up and we just got to kind of figure it out as we go along. And you know, the perfect plan doesn't always, always work out. Um, yeah. I have one last question. Well, two, but one, one last business question. So now you've had success product onboarding implementation. What's yeah. the toughest one? Um, toughest one for me is, um, customer success. Uh, I think primarily because again, at, at my core, I'm a product person and I want to, I, I, and I, as a person right outside of work, I want to make everybody happy. This is yep. my struggle in product yeah. is that I hate to say no, but I say no a lot. Yeah. Right. I have to say no all the time. Um, the, the biggest struggle is when, um, you know, you want to pull things forward on the roadmap or you really want to get that customer success manager to, to trust the product team or to rely on them. And so, um, customer success for me, I'm, I'm not a salesperson by any means. I don't, uh, say that I am, I rely very heavily on my CRO when we get into negotiations for contract. It's just not a natural fit for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'd rather give everything away and, and get someone to be happy than I would be to negotiate a deal. Um, and, and I'm well aware of that. That's the, that's, I think the biggest thing is that I'm aware that that's a challenge for me. Yeah. Um, but that'll that hopefully come through, right? That, yeah. That's the, the beauty of, of developing your career. And, but that's the hardest part for me is that I just want, I want customer success to be just that yeah. help our customers be successful, but they are saddled with this renewal piece. Yeah. It's, um, but it's, it's a big, yeah. And, and so awesome that you're recognizing that and everything because some people, you know, it's always good to know what your weaknesses are. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's yep. great. Uh, so we'll wrap up on, on, on a, on a lighter side. What's been your COVID hobby? My COVID hobby. Um, You've got the bread making instruments, great question. puzzles. Uh, I'm trying to think. So <laughs> you have a two year old, so I'm sure. Yeah, I have a two year old. So that's the thing. Is that like, Oh, COVID. Um, so a couple things we, there was a lot of banana bread making, um, early <laughs> on, like banana related products. We were trying to do like gluten free and all that, you know, yep, no yep. sugar, low sugar. So yep. bananas were rampant in our house for like the first three months of the pandemic. Um, but now not, not the like, easiest so, or least expensive thing to keep around. Cause my kids, no. I buy two bunches a week and they're gone by like Tuesday. Yeah, like they're the, it's crazy. Everyone's eating them and you're like, no, I have to wait until they're actually ripe. It, it shows how, so, by the way, how smart kids are because they recognize it's straight sugar. Like, oh, yeah. that's sugar and I'm just gonna keep <laughs> <Yeah>. eating it. <laughs> right. Um, so that was a big one. And then we moved out of the city. Um, so I'm adjusting to suburban life. Yeah, um, I can see in your background there. We can't see yeah, it's the nice yeah. fall leaves. On the, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, those are the, the two big things. My husband is uh, responsible for everything outside. I'll do the house, but um, I want nothing to do with the outside. So it's been, uh, you know, COVID with a two-year-old, is COVID with anyone is hard. Um, but banana bread and, and uh, moving have been the two big things for us. Oh, that's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to ask you to hold on for one quick second. I'm going to stop yeah. the recording. And thanks so okay. much. And uh, Thank we'll you. hopefully chat again. This has been awesome. And we yeah. covered a lot of ground. <laughs> so I'm super yeah. happy about that. So hold Thanks on. for including me. Sure.